Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training's really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content that it provides, make sure you hop over and check out the all-new Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is the combination of the CVA SPS community and the Rugby Strength Coach community, bringing you what is sure to be the Internet's leading resource for continuing education for strength and conditioning professionals. Combining these two resources has allowed us to bring some of the best content from some of the best minds in the world together for your one-stop shop to better improve the continuing education for not just yourself, but your entire staff. Bringing together all of the lectures from the Rugby Strength Coach community, along with the lectures exclusively done for the Central Virginia Sport Performance community, and all the lectures performed at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar, make this an absolute must for performance coaches around the world. The world-class lectures at the Strength Coach Network are not all that you'll see as well. The discussion in the forums and the support and the career guidance from some of the top practitioners in the world, from people all over the world, makes this an absolute must and a great place for you to network, learn, and grow as a performance professional. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS, that's C-V-A-S-P-S, to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. We're sure you're going to find great value in the Strength Coach Network and are really excited to have you involved. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS to check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely sensational talk with the Denver Pioneers Director of Sport Performance, Matt Shaw. Matt's going to dive right into it, guys, and he's going to give us a step-by-step breakdown and look into not just how they've built their monitoring and sport performance program, but what's making it successful, how they're working with coaches, and how they're building really the facility and everything, the facilities, excuse me, and everything they're building out there around this athlete-centered model that they have and, and really doing some sensational stuff with it. We then get into, you know, a discussion about how he's looked outside of our scope of practice to bring other things into what they do at Denver um, and has had some really great success with that. And then we finish off talking about travel, uh, his role with that and his role with nutrition with the athletes and what they're trying to build uh, together with the department in that realm too. Guys, this, this really is an awesome talk. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I uh, appreciate it. I'm excited to be on. Yeah, man. So, hey, listen, let's uh, let's just give the quick little Spark Notes version as to, you know, where you are, how you got down to Denver, and, and what you got going on down there. Yeah. So, I've been uh, – this is my seventh year at Denver. So, I currently oversee hockey and men's soccer, um, two really successful programs. Uh, won our eighth national championship in hockey two years ago – or three years ago now. Um, you know, we've had an incredibly successful program. Um, got the opportunity to work with a ton of NHL guys during the summertime and the off season, as well as our soccer team. And we have an MLS group that's rolling right now with combine prep and a bunch of guys are getting ready to graduate and turn into their professional careers here shortly. Um, you know, before this, I was actually in Boston for about 10 years, um, finished up high school out there, went to BU um, for my undergrad and my master's, and then worked full time for them while I did about five internships within the area, um, as well as down in South Carolina with football. That's awesome, man. So now you guys have got some, some pretty awesome stuff cooking out there in Denver. Um, 
let's let's dive into that. You know, you've you've brought some toys with you. You've you've started to implement some things. So let's talk about the building process that you guys have had with your, you know, your your monitoring sports science type department. Yeah, so so it's been interesting. It's been an evolution. Um, when first arrived here, I think we had an unbelievable skeleton laid out. You know, our weight room um, was built about nine years ago. Um, it's kind of unique in that it's 110 yards long, so it's actually sits directly underneath the soccer stadium. Um, so we have 65 yards of turf that ran straight down the middle. So we had a ton of space, um, but it was interesting. You know, where we had a lot of. I think usage in terms of the amount of space that we we're able to integrate everything from warm ups to conditioning in the middle of the winter when we had issues with weather. Um, we also had a lot of limitations in terms of eval. So we naturally started to progress um, our tech usage. Um, initially, it was using everything from pulse oximeters with heart rate monitors, whatever we could get our hands on. Um, and it's naturally become, I think, more financially supported within the department as we found success. So in the last few years, we've dipped pretty heavily into monitoring. Um, we've used apps such as, you know, Fit for 90. Um, then we switched over to HRV for training. Um, so we have a lot of our athletes that are taking HRV every single morning and then a subjective questionnaire attached with it and getting proactive um, information related to the readiness level of our athletes. Um, we've got catapult rolling amongst four different teams now. Um, so we've gotten pretty, I think, involved within the monitoring side of things. And, you know, I think initially when we brought Catapult in, it actually was to really help educate our, our coaches, to give them support regarding how we were integrating, you know, practices, how things were getting structured within the practice um, to really maximize the athlete's development. Um, and then we've gone further, further down the rabbit hole with chasing individual based, you know, stress and making sure that we're really giving our athletes the best chance to, to succeed on the weekend when they're competing at their best. Um, and then that ended up turning into gym aware and now force plates um, probably within the next five weeks here. So then who's handling all of that data that's coming in through Catapult? Yeah, so it, it's interesting. Um, so we have three full time staff. Um, which definitely can pose some type of limitations. Um, you know, we have 17 teams here and we've got two part-time staff that kind of assist as fellows. Um, and it's actually all handled in-house within our staff. Um, so what we've done is really empowered um, our full-time staff to not only, you know, be, be the, I think the front people in, involved within the programs in terms of managing, you know, the weight room, but also everything from warm-ups to recovery work, regen, you know, we're doing RPR work on athletes. Um, and then we're also handling the sports science integration. And we've tried to create a streamlined approach behind how we've integrated it. Um, we got our interns involved with, you know, tagging and making sure that the, uh, the workflow is appropriate for us. Um, but we've got all of our reports really structured. And so it's almost in like that automated stage where we're able to daily send out reports to our coaches and then get involved proactively with making recommendations the next day. So then going back and, you know, talking about the training modalities that you were leading into after that, how does that impact or how is that impacted by the, the tracking and the monitoring? And yeah. what have you seen that impact to be? Yeah, I think when, when you look at monitoring, you know, I, I think initially for us, it was keeping it as simple as possible. First off, you know, what are we doing in terms of drill selections? We actually started by coding every drill that our coaches were mandating within practice. Um, we took maybe three to four different metrics. We were looking at total or sorry, uh, density measures. So things like distance per minute, trim per minute, high speed running per minute. And then I think it was moderate speed running velocity per minute. Um, and then we did the same thing on the ice for hockey. Um, was looking at high force um, stride output per minute. Um, so it was a little bit different, but essentially the same type of metrics. Um, so we were able to really start by quantifying what really – each drill was was posing within practice and how those were getting structured together to try to chase what our optimal practice plan was going to look like and then how that stress was going to undulate throughout the week. Um, when we did that, I think it further led us into saying, 
you know, really can we divide practices by really high intensity practices or the volume of high speed work in almost like a tissue perspective. So, you know, not just gauging it by, you know, distances or totals, but really looking at it from, well, what's the demand actually on a tissue level? Um, are we stressing type one fiber or is it getting more into type two fiber and almost dividing practices probably closer to that side? Um, and that drastically, I think, led to changes being made and making sure that our lifts were always kind of in conjunction with the same type of tissue stress that we were seeing within practice. So, you know, our, our lift days then become our, our type two uh, stress days on the field. And we try to match that as closely as possible. Um, and we've gotten more along the lines of using gym wear to auto regulate what we're doing within those workouts in season, um, probably more so than any other period of time. Um, just because it helps, I think, alleviate a lot of the guesswork behind an athlete's readiness level. Um, it puts them into you know proper loading parameters based off of their nervous system. Um, so even if somebody's fatigued, it'll it'll auto regulate and bring their their total loading down to a more appropriate, manageable level for them to uh, perform. So can we keep running down that fiber typing manhole that you had going there? Yeah. How was that determined? What did you look at? How did you break that down and how did you guys then communicate that? Yeah, I think it for us, it just has to do with like what the primary and the largest amount of stress is coming from. So if we're, if we're looking at it throughout the week, like the days where we're going to go through and hit the highest volume of high speed running, that's going to be the day where we're going to try to match that stress, both plyometrically as well as in, in creating almost like a tendon response and getting into that type two tissue dominant lifting day. Um, on the other days, we may do more aerobic based warm ups. Um, so even keeping the warm ups to almost match practice stress um and i think it's just about priorities and, and really structuring the stress to not continually overextend the athletes every single day um you know you're you're always just like you know if you think about like energy systems you always have every single energy system present but what's the predominant amount of stress that's present within the practice is going to determine really what we're going to try to chase after the fact within the weight room and then you and your staff are working in conjunction with the coaches to have this all predetermined for the day, week, month. How is that doing? Yeah, I think we, I think, you know what, it's mostly week to week for us. You know, every week for us may look a little bit different, whether we're in conference or out of conference. You know, we have some weeks where we may be upwards of three or four competitions with soccer or, you know, just two on other weeks or maybe even one. Um, so we generally will take things week by week, um, and then it's really looking at the accumulated stress of the, probably the previous 21 days and and then kind of determining how far we really want to push individuals or whether we need to give them additional rest periods during times. Uh, but you know, the thing that uh, gets really interesting is how proactive our coaches are. Um, soccer, for instance, we've got one of the best soccer coaches in the country, and Jamie Franks, um, he is meticulous when it comes to practice planning. Every single day um, or the night actually before the next practice, I get a practice report with, you know, rest times, total volumes that they're going to be doing every single drill. You know, you can see the format and how the drills can be structured, even on the spacing on the field with different diagrams. So there's a level of consistency behind the information that's being delivered from our coaching staff that then is, allows us to look at what we're doing within practice and setting the next practice up. Um, for to change based on what we're trying to do going into competition. Um, so I think at the beginning of the week, we know that usually the first day back is going to be a, a pretty aerobic and dominant um, you know, day for us to just kind of get our feet back underneath us, drive some blood flow. Um, we match warm-up stress to be a little bit more prolonged um, and a little bit less intensity. But you know, those are the areas where it's like once that gets hit, then we start to look at the rest of the week and where the competition days fall and trying to set them up for success, you know, with either higher or lighter volumes based off of how soon that competition is going to hit. So walk me through how you set that up then. So you're looking at warm-ups, yep. you're looking at training, like yep. how are you determining what pegs are going in what hole then? Yeah. So, you know, I think with warm-ups, you know, for us, it's, you know, we actually will use our pre-game warm-up actually as well as during practices that have a really high intensity level so we call them pioneer days 
Um, Pioneer days for us are incredibly high intensity days that have a ton of team competition and battling. So it's probably closer along the lines of emotional and physical stress that these athletes are going to be competing in. So during those practices and warm ups, we'll start with a set warm up that we do actually pre game. So it has the same emotional context behind it. Um, we'll go through, you know, a level of high speed work or competitive agility work prior to them getting released into practice. Um, so there's already that emotional context being set um, on lighter days that may be more aerobic and pr predominantly more set up on just like technical work or flow based practicing. Um, those are the practices where we just kind of will go in almost like a steady state and almost like a nasal breathing based warm up where it may be 15, 20 minutes of constant movement. It's more aerobic. There's less plyometrics involved during the final stages of the warm up. Um, and so we'll make sure that we're kind of matched really matching up with, you know, the things that we're going to be doing within practice that way, you know, we are almost recovering from whatever that tissue that was stressed the day before, you know, if we're doing speed work every single day, it's, you know, it's going to overextend that organism at some point. Yeah. I love that. That's absolutely sensational. So then do you guys come back at the end of the day, uh, with like cool down recovery, recoup stuff. And then yeah. if so, how does that then also tie into what you're doing in the weight room after practice? Yeah. So after practice, you know, the nice thing is we've tried to centralize all of our resources. So almost every single one of our athlete locker rooms have recovery pumps, Norma techs. We've got resources that are being, you know, if they're not currently built out, there's plans to build those resources within those locker rooms. Um, you know, we have plans to bring in hyper ice and massage guns and give access really in an immediate location where the athletes are going to be under high frequency um, you know, the weight room, we're continually building out things such as that, that will, again, give them access consistently behind different resources. Um, so it's nice. You know, our, our athletic training room, I wouldn't say is state of the art, but, you know, we, we know when we want to do certain things. Like if we're doing two higher volume days back to back, chances are we're probably going to have the athletes go through ice bathing or contrast work. Um, we're going to do extended amount of tissue um, work and doing, you know, myofascial release and soft tissue work to down regulate maybe some of that tension that's been built up from those higher stress practices. Um, and so things get set up, I think, purposefully and to manage really what they're doing. If it's a lighter day, then we may do things like flush rides. We may do more aerobic, you know, maybe more hot tub um, based modalities in terms of regen to help drive passive, you know, recovery. Um, so, you know, I think even now it's really diving down the rabbit hole into like nutritional based recovery. Um, you know, that for us has been, I think an area of weakness, like a lot of mid major institutions. Uh, but we're even looking now at things like, you know, providing cooking classes for our athletes, um, to help them better understand nutrient, um, you know, uptake as well as the skills that are going to be required of them once they move off campus. Um, so we have kind of a lot of things that are continually being looked at in terms of the regen side, as well as how we can structure things into a holistic model. That's sensational. And to have a direction that you know you want to go in makes continuing down that path so much smoother. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it's funny. Like it, when I first got here, I think I knew roughly where we wanted to go. You know, it was establishing a holistic program that was going to incorporate a lot of different, not only principles and methods, but philosophies. You know, I, we've taken things from the physical therapy world, the chiropractic world, and we've had a lot of influences within the community regarding those areas. Uh, we have a, a chiropractor just down the road who's, you know, probably one of the most brilliant chiropractors I've ever been around. Uh, his name is Dr. Studholm. And, you know, it's interesting, like six years ago when I first met him, you know, he was a Grand Institute fellow. And so, you know, I started talking with him and then I started shadowing him at his practice after hours um, and just watching his implementation you know, and, and I had previous interest in the things that Todd Wright was doing with at the time it was Texas basketball um, regarding three dimensional locomotion. Um, and really, Dr. Studholm's practice was designed around not only delivering chiropractic work and, you know, a, a series of modalities that you'd probably normally find, but it was an entirely evidence based practice model. It was a neuraxon force plate tread 
Hucknall with motion capture. So he was able to get, you know, really every joint range of motion compensation pattern within gait and locomotion and then set them up for a series of treatments. And then on the end of it was actually using an athletic trainer to build in motor control change. And so we've taken, you know, principles and areas that we've found within his practice and brought it in really into the, the collegiate setting. You know, and it's obviously it's a different maybe scope of implementation because we're not doing chiropractic based adjustments. Um, but we found other ways to to institute change. So maybe it's doing RPR or maybe it's doing, you know, almost like PRI techniques and getting kids into like an optimal situation and maybe that brief window of time when you make change, but then it's following up with really isometric based training or longer duration, you know, motor control work, trying to actually implement long-term change behind a lot of dysfunctions that kids have. So if a kid walks in with, you know, anterior pelvic tilt and they're incredibly locked down, you know, we may do posterior, you know, chain exercises to get them into that posterior position and opening up that anterior line of tension through different stretching techniques and 3D implementation behind stretching. But then it gets immediately followed up with motor control work where we might be doing different like bridge sequences with long duration isometrics. Um, and so and then it goes into like movement based work. So then following up with maybe gait or like running based movement where they actually have to use that that range of motion that's been opened up within context of the skill that they need to acquire. That's great. And it, I, I think that obviously building, you know, the kind of a part whole type idea off of that. Um, have there been any difficulties with that though? Because, you know, sometimes crossing that therapy line, if you may, yeah. um, can be a little, no pun intended, can be a little gray. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, and that's where we've looked at, you know, what can we do from our scope of practice, you know, and, and even when we looked at RPR and at the time when you know, we got certified as be activated with Doug, um, you know, we, we actually brought an athletic trainer with us. We immediately had buy-in from our sports medicine department. You know, we educated our sports med, you know, entire department about the context of how things were going to be delivered, whether it was through warm-up based activities or us actually going in and, and going through and doing activation points on athletes. But it was going to be done in a public area or within a treatment room with, you know, the full blessing of the athlete. And we were never going to extend ourselves into situations where we were going to cross that professional scope. Um, so there's always, you know, one safety of the athlete in mind, as well as, you know, putting ourselves into good positions as practitioners. Uh, but then, you know, I think that there was a level of transparency behind implementation. You know, we talked to them about, all right, you know, if we use RPR, like this is where we can see it making, you know, a huge, you know, positive change within our athletes. And then this is where we see how it can be built into really a system of implementation. It wasn't just ripping RPR during a warm up and then that was it. It was let's use these as, you know, basically methods to open up, you know, a a way to actually, you know, train an athlete with a higher level of neuromuscular recruitment or within like a more optimal state than a series of compensation patterns that may be walking through the door, you know, when they first started uh, and then building off of those things through, through training methods. Um, and I think that just has more to do with evidence-based practice than it does with crossing professional boundaries. You know, we're not manipulating athletes. We're not really extending ourselves past our professional scope but we have taken on the philosophy of let's try to actually make long-term change behind, you know, whether it's a series of dysfunctions that an athlete may walk into, or I think being more present and aware of how an athlete's moving or how they're compensating or whether, you know, they're missing internal rotation or they have ankle and foot issues that are going on that need to be addressed. We have a higher level of frequency and exposure with our athletes than maybe anybody else within the athletic department. So let's use those times to really make change. It's fantastic. And the results you've seen have been pretty far out, eh? Yeah. And, and I think, it, you know, the athletes appreciate it. Like the level of detail that goes into, you know, how they train. Um, you know, we do, you know, probably maybe 50% of the warm-ups I integrate are actually are barefoot just because, you know, I work with soccer where they're wearing compressed footwear and they're trying to squeeze into the smallest cleat that they possibly can. Or, you know, it's hockey and they're in a boot 
you know, in, in a skate where it's going to limit, you know, their shoe wear and, and how their foot mechanics and ankle mechanics occur. So there's times when, you know, we do things that I think make them self-aware behind foot mechanics, how their arch, you know, is interacting with the ground um, and how their foot will actually create, I think, a level of stability upstream as long as they're actually, you know, focused on how their foot's mechanically interacting with, you know, whether it's a bench, a ground, whatever surface that they're training on. That's great. And then, obviously, tying all those things together now, where where are you seeing these show up in competition? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, you know, we always look at, you know, a key performance indicator for us is one injury rate. So soft tissue based injuries. Um, do we have any? What are the ones that we're having? You know, the knock on wood, we've been incredibly durable and resilient as teams here. Um, we don't have many soft tissue injuries. Um, you know, our, as long as our coaches are communicating about practice across the board, you know, I think from our side, we placed a level of demand on our coaching staff to be proactive and to keep our athletes on the field and competing at a high level at all times. So I think, you know, if you look at how we're implementing things, we're doing proactive things such as RPR, we're going through and doing 3D based warm ups. We're looking at tissue stress, you know, really by tissue type. Um, and we're still getting our athletes incredibly strong. You know, one of the biggest KPIs that we have is, is actually relative strength, you know, and so everything gets built into a system and it's not just one, you know, I think philosophy or one method of training. Um, but it's, you know, can we get our athletes as strong as humanly possible and then, you know, fill up the other buckets using other modalities or other sequences of training? That's great. Now let's get, since you are in the middle of it right now with hockey and yep. being out in Denver, how do you account then with all of these things and how you're training them? You guys don't have any short road trips. How are you handling that with those guys? Yeah. So travel for us can, can get tricky. Um, you know, within our conference, the closest trips that we have are probably an hour and a half to Colorado Springs, um, to play CC or maybe air force if they're on our schedule. Um, every other travel is probably a minimum of a two hour flight plus buses. Um, or if we're going to the Northeast, we're looking at a three and a half to four hour flight. Um, so for us, you know, it, it depends on kind of where we're going, um, and the timing behind it. Um, if we're going East, and so central to East Coast, you know, usually what we'll do is we're actually try to get out there as fast as we can. Um, we'll try to leave first thing in the morning if we can get the right flight times and then actually practice there, um, you know, late afternoon and then get into kind of normal rhythm of work. Um, so even when we arrive, it's trying to hopefully set times up with our coaching staff to actually allocate proper warm ups, make sure that we have proper food set up. Um, you know, this has probably been the best, like, you know, we use electrolytes, you know, we use different type of, um, you know, post game shakes, we give them access to food at a high frequency. And this is probably the best that we've done it maybe all year. Um, so it's been interesting, like nutrition, like I said, has been probably one of the biggest issues, you know, and even with competing against other schools in terms of resources, but, you know, recently, you know, we just built out a, it was a $2.7 million locker room renovation. It just got done within the last month. Um, we've had a ton of support, um, through donors to help, you know, allocate things such as into really donor support to, to drive nutrition. And so we're now offering meals within locker rooms almost across the board for almost every team here. Um, so it's great. You know, we use our food provider on campus as well as fresh fruit, um, deliveries through Sodexo, or we'll use things that, you know, maybe a community based product, like, you know, for us, honey stinger is a local product. And so they've been an unbelievable sponsor, um, in helping us find, you know, resources to, to travel with, um, as well as provide within our fueling station within the weight room. Um, so travel for us, you know, we try to be as proactive as possible, you know, make sure that athletes are hydrating, make sure that they understand that travel is usually going to be a disturbance in their normal day to day. Um, so how can they try to keep things as consistent as possible? You know, can we, you know, if we get them into the airport right when they arrive, can we immediately, you know, get them to stretch? Can we go through maybe some posterior chain activation just because they've been sitting in a flex position that's probably going to go through like an inhibitory reaction on their hamstrings and glutes. So let, let's drive those things on the back end once we arrive and then let's practice and kind of drive a little bit of blood flow work and then immediately follow it up with quality nutrition on the back end. 
Sensational. So then let me get you out of here on this, Matt. Yeah. What's next for you and the Pioneers? Yeah. You know, so we're, we're excited. Uh, you know, recently we, you know, we basically allocated enough money to, uh, through donor support to get force plates. Um, the one thing that has always been a really a level, high level of interest for us is, you know, using that evidence-based model practice to not only to evaluate proactively, you know, discrepancies or asymmetries that athletes have, but also to evaluate how effective our programs are. Um, so if we can start to, you know, get these force plates in and start getting them up and running and proactively evaluate every student athlete that we have here and looking at everything from asymmetries to, you know, performance indicators such as peak force, um, you know, impulse time, um, left to right asymmetry on rate of force development, then we can also begin to look at how those things are getting manipulated within their training environment. Um, and that's where I think then we can really take a critical look at the methods that we are applying within the weight room or on the field within practice and truly ensure that everything is aligning with what we're actually trying to look at and achieve within their training. I love it. I do, man. And have fun with the force plates too. There, there can be a lot yeah. of numbers and it can, it can yeah. get you going, but I, I love the direction you got, man. Matt, this is absolutely killer stuff. I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us today. Oh, no, my pleasure. I was excited to jump on. Yeah, man. Well, listen, brother, this will be up soon, and yep. uh, people are going to love it. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Appreciate yeah, it, man. man. We'll be in touch real soon, buddy. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Yep. And a huge thanks to the University of Denver's Director of Sport Performance, Matt Shaw, for spending the time with us today. Guys, a 15,000-foot view into how they've built a very successful program out there, the directions they're going, why they've made the selections they have, how they're implementing things and how they continue to build, not just in a training uh, area, but in monitoring and nutrition as well. I can't thank Matt enough for spending the time with us today and being so open, honest, and candid with his sharing. Matt, thank you so much, man. Keep up the great work out there. It's, it's truly appreciated. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. Again, we are just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we possibly can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.